uh, but I wanted to, to get moving to welcome you uh, to the third week of our Turbo Group of seeking to really develop the, the habits, the, the values, the different pieces that go into having a great life-giving small group. Because here at ZUMC, we believe, as Pastor Dave said in worship, that relationships are absolutely vital. Uh, relationships are vital to the life of the church. They're vital to people being a part and walking with Jesus, walking with Jesus together. Uh, it's something that we don't ever do alone. We do that together. We need to be a part of a group, a tribe, who are encouraging one another, holding each other accountable, uh, just speaking truth when we need to hear it, of all those things that go into journeying with Jesus together as fellow disciples. So the first week, uh, we just kind of gave a, a big picture view, looked at a lot of nuts and bolts about what does it look like to be a leader, what kind of questions do we ask, how do we go about those. And then last week, we started to, to narrow in more. We kind of lowered it down. We focused specifically in on invitation and how invitation is a way that we can make people feel valued, make them feel wanted, how we can reach out and, and include them in that way. And so we went through all those pieces. If you weren't here for those first two, I have the notes up here that I can give you afterward. Uh, it's really all going into a compendium, I guess, or one whole training. Each one of them will have one for this week as well. Um, but this week we've come to hospitality. It's creating a welcoming environment. Um, as we started to do last week, we kind of suggested this meeting format. And we started to, to follow that a little bit last week, and we're going to try to do that a little more this week. We're going to have some sections where we're kind of living into this format so that we can experience it, because we actually learn best not just from hearing, but from doing, uh, experiential learning. And so the suggested meeting format that we gave the first week was first uh, to kind of have a welcome. Uh, and an opening prayer. To second, have an icebreaker of some sort, something that gets people talking. Now, you all have already been talking around food. Food is actually like one of the most natural icebreakers you can have. You put food in front of people, and for some reason, we as humans, I think it's the way that God has created us, when we start eating it together, we seem to talk. Like if you take a quiet group and you put food in front of them, they automatically start to talk about things, even if it's very light and surface level. But that's the point of an icebreaker, is just to get people talking. The third is follow up from the prior week's next steps. Uh, so what you were supposed to do in the time in between, because the Bible is not just about learning and knowing these truths, but it's about allowing that to transform us, about living it out. Uh, the fourth part we have are some primer questions, which will lead into the topic for the day or the scripture passage for the day. The scripture passage you'd read, and then you'd have the questions, the discussion that goes around that. Again, you'd circle back around and you're thinking about next steps. So what does that mean for me this week? What are we going to do? How is this going to cause me to live differently before closing in prayer? Uh, so we won't fully do that today. Or there's going to be more seminar style pieces because that is kind of the nature of what, what it is we are doing. Uh, but I wanted to uh, start out with an icebreaker, something for you all to to dive into. Actually, I skipped over prayer. I'm going to pray first, thank the Lord for the, for the food that we had, and then I'll see what Dave's up, up with here. So maybe he's just, you're just observing, huh? Just popping in, okay. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the food. Uh, we thank you for Peggy for preparing it, bringing it uh, for us. We ask that you'd bless this food to our bodies, uh, that it would build us up, uh, that it might sustain us, that we could go and continue to uh, follow you. We pray in this time uh, that your spirit would move uh, in us and through us. We pray that uh, as we converse and talk, that we could hear your voice, uh, that we could really uh, invest in uh, building a great small group because we want, Lord, to, to be connected to one another. We want to grow together. Uh, so, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, the icebreaker, though, one of the, the things to model, ways to get people talking. We've already got food, but one of the ones I thought we could do quick, this is another one that's a, a good example of something that I think is fairly low-key. And I say that with the knowledge that my wife is the kind of person who loathes icebreakers. Chastity is like, you're not going to make them do an icebreaker, are you? I was like, yes, yes, I am. Um, 
This one's fairly low key, though. If, I want you to just take five minutes and around your tables, uh, think about answering these five questions with items that you have on your person at this moment. So in your purse, in your wallet, in your pockets, on you. Uh, it might be hard to answer some of those, but just take five minutes and uh, go around and, and try to answer those questions with what you've got on you. Friends, I know uh, some of you are probably still answering the questions, but I want to move us on. I want to keep going to respect your time. I want to make sure we get through this. Each week, I've actually been decreasing the amount of material that I have planned in this. You'll notice that when you get the packets. They're thinner and thinner each week, and part of that is just the fact that I know there's going to be more conversation each week, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, the second part that I, I want to move into following up, following up from last week. We talked about thinking about seven people to invite to a small group. Not necessarily your small group, but thinking about seven people who you could invite in the church, you know, inside the church or outside the church, from your life, from your neighbors, your friends, etc., to be a part of a small group. Uh, so what I want you to discuss quickly, I mean, not super fast, but just at a decent pace at the tables is, were you able to do that this last week? If you weren't here, then you can say, no, I wasn't. And the answer, why weren't you able to do that? Because I wasn't here. Uh, but just go through that quickly of, of those different pieces and think about, um, yeah, think about were you able to come up with those seven names uh, and how did you feel about it? Are we still, do we need a little bit of time or are we, we're good? We can start moving through or you're going to come up here and you're going to help? Um, you want to say bye? Okay, give me a kiss. I'll see you in a little bit, okay? I love you. Go home and take a nap. Yeah, so then we can play. You can play when Daddy gets home if you go take a nap. <gasps> what a deal. Yeah. She seems so, like, angelic. She needs so, seems so angelic right now. You should have seen her yesterday. Would not listen to a thing we said. It was like, don't touch that. Oh my gosh. So, um, I know we've had two sets of questions. I want to go to a third. And it's, it's, we can do this one seminar style where I'll, I'll write the answers on the board. We'll, we'll kind of share those. So you can just shout them out. But what comes to your mind when you think of the word hospitality? That is the theme for today. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart. <laughs> Martha Stewart, the, um, the cooking and, and home decor, not Martha Stewart felon. Okay, yeah. Well, I mean, they are the same person, but, you know, that's what you're, you're thinking of. Yeah, that's true. I gotcha. That's good. No. Yeah. Taxes. Taxes. Hospitality. Because our CPA allows us to write off our, lunch, our lunches um, at, uh, from our, our art studio with a potential oh, client God. or um, if, you know, businesses, yeah. if businesses talk about and she actually lists on whatever schedule, she calls it hospitality. So, so it's a write-off. That's a good attack. Oh, say so yeah, hospitality can be, a, in business, can be a tax write-off, yeah. So if you take a trip or uh, have a, a meal, you should think about having, talking about business. That's <laughs> the, the tip for today. Under uh, the term of hospitality. Under the term of hospitality. I like it. Um, other, other words that come to mind. Greeting. Greeting. Welcoming. Welcoming. Congeniality. Conviviality. Conviviality. I'm truly that. <laughs> food. I like that. Connecting. Yeah. Happiness. Happiness. Name recognition. 
Name recognition, okay. The nice guy that welcomes you every time you walk in this door to church. What's his name? Shakes your hand. Don? Don. Is that? He, come, he shakes your hand. He's happy to see you. He's a poster. Don. Yeah, Don does a great job down at that end. I was going to say, then, uh, I think I have it up there. What then do you think of when you think of a person who is hospitable? What images come to mind? Warm? Can we see that okay? Big smile. Big smile. Remembers your name. Name recognition. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure how to say that. It makes perfect sense. It's just when you're trying to write it on a board in like one or two words. Yeah, uh, yeah but they're. That's a good one. As you were saying that, it almost, I almost thought of somebody who's observant and they see people who might be looking, like you said, who, who are looking for something or. Proactive. Yeah, proactive. Helpful. Yeah. So, how how would you think about creating a warm and welcoming environment, the kind of place where, uh, well, I don't know about taxes, but uh, where the rest of this uh, is, you know, where these are being embodied. How do you typically think about creating a hospitable environment? Is that what I have up there? I think we could even specify. What about thinking about what, what do you think of when you think of making a, a small group hospitable environment? All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. yeah. Uh, being a good listener. Mm hmm. Being a good listener. I mean, so, sort of just a, a, a comfortable space, you know. Like, mm -hmm. so, so coming into somebody's living room and having comfortable furniture and a place to sit and a sense of warmth. Hmm, I like that. So. Snacks. That doesn't hurt. The warmth I'm thinking of. Snacks. Go back uh, warmth right now may not be the best Yeah. Thing. You want a warm and welcoming environment. Unless you said it's the summer, then you want a cool and yes. cool and comforting environment. <laughs> Donna Medic is probably the epitome of that because she has the most welcoming home that okay. I think. Okay. Well, what makes it the most welcoming home? She has all these interesting things. She does have comfortable chairs, but her house has, it's just such an interesting Her house thing. says, come on in. Yeah. yeah. I think it, your house actually literally says that, doesn't it, something? Yeah. And then it says, I'm not Martha, right, on the Martha rock? Martha doesn't live here. I have a rock that says, but Martha doesn't live here. Martha doesn't live here. <laughs> so there's no... <laughs> so I love this. It's all working together. Interesting. I think of someone who um, shares themselves to kind of, kind of break the ice. Sometimes it can be difficult to get people to share. If you're not sharing, then all that. So um, it kind of sounds like... You might almost, uh, uh, vulnerability, that they kind of make themselves vulnerable, put themselves out there, and that's a way of, of, uh, of welcoming people. Yeah. I, I think to have a welcoming group, you have to have a leader that is comfortable enough to invite everybody in and welcome them, makes them feel comfortable, makes them feel at peace, you know, so they have to have kind of enough ways that are secure in themselves that other people feel comfortable. Mm hmm yeah, so I did, I did pick out welcoming leadership. welcoming leadership, and you also said being, as we talked about last week, inviting, and that's part of it.
when the leader is prepared and seems confident mm -hmm. in what they're doing, it, or, or to put the flip side on it, if, a, if I would go into a group and the leader kind of is insecure in things, I come away with a feeling like, oh, I've got to help them make this work, and which tenses me up uh, in a group. If I, if I go into a place and, you know, you're, you're very well prepared here today, and mm -hmm. so I don't feel like I have to do the work of your teaching. And so that's, mm -hmm. that makes things more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a great one, though. Lead, being leader, being prepared, and as you said, I, I think there's two pieces of that. If you're not prepared, then you're not going to be comfortable, right? And then we just naturally, as humans, we mirror each other. Like if you've ever been in a conversation, and you're standing there and you cross your arms, and you wait like 30 seconds, and you watch they cross their arms, and you you know you can kind of. I don't, I'm not, I don't toy with people like that. I know some people who like to do that. They're like, I like to see what I can get other people to do when I do it. I'm like, oh, that's probably not healthy. But we just naturally mirror each other. And so if you're comfortable, if you, if you have that sense, then they're going to be more comfortable and they're going to be more open. If you are open about things, then, then they're going to be more open about things. It, we, we kind of reciprocate, I think, in a way. Um, part of it is probably going back to that trust of trust is based on relationship and can I, can I reciprocate this without being injured or hurt? If the person is opening themselves up, then I'm going to open myself up. If they're closing themselves off, I'm probably going to close myself off. Um, it's just kind of how we, that subtle dance that we do. Um, are there, yeah, go ahead. Well, in my belief in a church environment, I mean, there are so many folks who know so much more about our Lord than I do, mm -hmm. but I know a fair amount. But mm -hmm. I think there has to be some way in a Christ-filled room where we feel comfortable, as we've mentioned, about I'm okay, you're okay. I come from the era of I'm okay, you're okay, mm -hmm. or getting the yes. Even though folks who have more biblical knowledge, perhaps, than I don't necessarily make me feel like I'm wet salt, like I'm being there. Yeah. Kind of a com 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 yeah, it sounds like almost what you're saying is that you're comfortable with where you are in your, I, I'm going to maybe put some words in your mouth. You can tell me if I'm totally wrong. I mean, where you are in your faith walk, right? That's, it's not about us all being at the same place, but it's about where we are and where God is taking us. And so it sounds like a comfort, of, uh, uh, welcoming and hospitable group would be one where people are at those different points, but you're walking together, and you don't feel like you're competing. Because I think so much in a church environment, we can almost possibly have even been kind of like a victim of being browbeaten, like, well, you don't know as, like you're saying like this, you don't know as much as I do. Yeah. And so, but it's, but my being raised to a higher level mm -hmm. in a comfortable way where I feel like I'm part of the equation. That's why I use the old terms from my college days of getting to yes, yeah. or I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah. So kind of a non-judgmental. Yeah, I think that's a... I'm going to do what I did. I hear that. JD, JD. Yeah. Which, of course, the irony of, of it all is when you decide to follow Jesus, what you really have to say is, I can't do this, and I, you know, there's no way I can know enough or do enough to be right. It's, it's almost you know, it's that great, great irony that it's really coming to God with your hands open and saying, I have nothing, it puts us a very equal level. The ground at the, at the foot of the cross is level in many ways. The other thing I would add to, just what, based on that, is just privacy. Like, mm -hmm. people need to know that what they share during that mm -hmm. time stays in that room. Confidential. Yeah, confidentiality. Uh, it's going to be hard to see this one. Confidentiality? Um, I'm trying to talk. I'm not, we're going to talking and writing. Confidentiality. Right. Yeah. We're not very good. Thank you. I think another fear people have is they're going to get involved in something that's going to go three or four hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So respecting time is a good way. Uh, I'm running out of space, but respecting time is a good way to, to be hospitable, to be welcoming. And respecting, respecting the time that they have, have committed to that and not, not going you know, above that and abusing that of what they've given you. <laughs> That's good. Have a timekeeper. Make sure I try to kind of check out and make sure we're we're flowing through the different stuff. Um, those are all I think fantastic things. We filled a board with attributes and just different ways of of doing that. Um, I anticipate you guys having some really great ones. Uh, but I wanted to still make sure we kind of went through some, some nuts and bolts of what that might look like, uh, of, of thinking through m setting a welcoming and, and hospitable environment uh, for those who are coming to a small group. So I set out 10 of these different things, uh, and these are actually taken from a book. I reference it in, um, in the notes. You can look more on that if you, you want more information on this. But the first is meet in an accessible location. Um, we, you know, you can have your house that's not as accessible of a location, but is a more intimate location. The church is a very accessible location. Um, it's, you know, we have set aside spaces that can be reserved here at the church for meeting in different small groups and even. Uh, when fall comes, there'll be specific times where there's childcare offered for those who will need that. So you know that's one way that we can we can have that uh, set aside. For those who are outside the church, that might not be. You know, this is as I tell people, they're like, "Oh, you're at Zionsville UMC." I'm like, "Yes, it's like the churchiest looking church building in Zionsville." Like, "Oh, I know where that is, right across from Mulberry Fields." Um, it can be a little bit intimidating sometimes for those who are outside the church. If they just didn't grow up to this, they're not used to it. And so sometimes we can think about more informal spaces. We can think about uh, coffee shops or restaurants. Now, depending on how intimate that environment is, you know, there are certain things you might not feel comfortable talking with where there's a person sitting in the booth behind you. You just kind of got to think about those things as you're selecting a place to be. There's pros and cons of each of those. And so you, you're kind of weighing them in, in the different ways. But there's a lot of free places that you can meet uh, for your small group that are fairly informal and accessible. Uh, the second thing is choosing a time when most of the group members are able to attend. Now, some of the stuff, we're going to have these set and people sign up for it. They know how coming into it, that's when it is. But if we're starting something new, of course, or we're changing something, we want to think about how are we going to make sure that people can actually be there. It sounds silly, but I feel like it has to be said. Um, if you are looking for a program time, there's actually a scheduling tool that is called Doodle. If you were to type Doodle into Google, I know you think of like doodling a picture, but Doodle allows you to send out emails and you select set times of like, these are the options on different days or days of the week. And people can select all of them that work for them. And then after everybody's answered, you can literally look right down the list and you can see, oh, well, Tuesdays work for 9 of 10 of the people, but Wednesdays work for 10 of 10, and Thursdays only work for one person. You, know, you, you can schedule that way that helps. Um, when we're scheduling, we always want to think about the natural rhythm of the week. You know, Friday night's usually a pretty busy night for a lot of people, so it's not always the best night. But for some groups of people, they're like, why well, don't do stuff on Fridays? I specifically have scheduled everything during the week, and like Friday is my off night. I would be fine with doing that. You kind of got to figure out when people have a natural rhythm to it. Uh, number three, and this one kind of goes into setting the environment. Arrange seating in a circle so you face one another. Uh, right now, you all are sitting at tables facing one another for the conversation parts. But because it's a seminar style, you're facing forward. In a classroom, we all sit facing forward to hear the teacher. But because it's not about being a teacher and students, because it's about conversation, discussion among the group, you want to face each other. You can see each other. It's relational. Um, number four, show that you're expecting them and are glad that they are present uh, by ensuring that you have adequate seating and a warm and inviting environment. Um, I think 
you guys started to list off some things that were really helpful with that. But just think about what things would I want if I was showing up to a place for the first time, what would make me feel welcome? Uh, just general things. What would, what would lower uh, the stress level or the question? What would answer questions that I would have coming into it? Lower the stress level, make it more uh, welcoming. Uh, number five, consider giving a quick tour of the place uh, to show them where food and bathrooms are, if you have food, which we said is welcoming. Am I? Oh, I need to skip. Oh, I revised it. Yeah. Provide refreshments and snacks. Oh, where did, yeah, this is different. Thanks, guys, for letting me know. I appreciate it. I don't remember revising this, so that's the weird part. Yeah. Minimize, I might have reordered it a little bit. Minimize distractions. Sharon, you said, can you please shut the door so we can cut down on some of the noise? That's, you know, a great way. If you have a barking dog, that can make it hard to hold a conversation. We just want to minimize those things, turning off TVs, you know, different, different stuff like that. Um, providing in refreshments and light snacks. As we said, those are a great way to get people talking, to make them feel welcome and comfortable. Uh, snacks, food has always been this welcoming thing all around the world. Whatever culture you're in, part of their hospitality, it's like default, it's shared amongst all humans. That way, if you want to welcome someone, you offer them food and drink. So, you know, that's a, a cool thing. Good lighting, you know, you don't want it to be uh, so dark that you can't read <laughs> what you've got, but you don't want it to be so bright that you feel like you'll have to wear sunglasses inside. Uh, that's just kind of a simple one. Seven, having extra Bibles and copy of the study on hand. Uh, that way, if somebody comes and everybody else is ready, they don't feel like they're like, oh, I've been kind of singled out. You know, it's embarrassing if you show up at something and you're the only one who doesn't have something. Um, so having some extra Bibles or, or studies on hand is a good, good way to do it. If it's something that's printed, printing extra copies, you know. Um, eight, providing name tags of starting uh, new or welcoming someone new. That way it, it lowers the stress. You know, we've done that here when we've had new pastors coming on board just to let people know it's a good way to help learn names but it also just you're not stressed about okay what was what was his name what was his name what, what I can't remember what his name was you can look right on his shirt it it makes it so much easier uh, nine preparing for the study ahead of time you guys nailed that one it's so important uh, helps if you read through the scripture passage you know if you've got the the questions ahead of time Think through some answers that you might have. And then maybe even, if you want to take it a step further, think through, well, what questions do I then have based off of that? And it helps you prepare for that, that discussion. Uh, and as uh, Don so aptly pointed out, when you're prepared and you're going to be relaxed, it's going to help other people be relaxed and join the conversation. And then 10, welcome everyone who comes and introduce them. You know, and that doesn't have to be, hey, stand up in front of the group and we're going to introduce you. It could be as simple as when they come through the door, welcome them and then say, after this, tag them off with somebody else. You know, oh, this is so-and-so. And then introduce them to them personally. They can shake their hand. They can talk. You know, you could repeat that process or you could drop them off there. Um, one thing, I, I know a pastor who said what he loves to do and what he, he's trained the congregations that he's been a part of to do is, when they meet somebody new, if this is somebody in worship, and this person says, oh, you know, it's talking about their life. I love horses. And they think, oh, I know somebody else who loves horses. I should introduce them. They say, oh, you know what? You should meet so-and-so here in the congregation. They love that as well. And they naturally connect those people. You know, it's, it's, they've not only introduced themselves to them and made them feel welcome, but they've made a connection uh, with somebody else in uh, the congregation. So, I've been talking a lot. I want to ask, uh, when you visit someone's house and they go out of their way to prepare for you and welcome you, how does that make you feel? You can go ahead and say it if you... It makes you feel welcome. It makes you feel welcome.
noticed. Noticed. Valued. Valued. Save myself a word and say, want to return. Family. Family. Makes you feel like family. For whatever reason, I'm thinking of the, uh, was it Tom Burdett with Red Roof Inn? Famous line where he said, we'll leave the light on for you. You know, you're, ex you're expected. Included. Included. Yeah. So yeah. we do that in our house. I think that would houses or church. I think that would be mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. uh, so another one of those great answers that I'm trying to think of what, what I could summarize in words. You did kind of have a congenial, you said collegiality was one. Um, so kind of congeniality, I think, is also. Congenial. Uh, yeah. Collegiality. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Almost like Those are two. English was my worst subject in in school. But even almost like a step further, like we, there might be subjects where we have to agree to disagree, but we're still going to shake hands before and we're going to shake hands after, no matter what happens in between them. Mm -hmm. We still love each other. Because there will be those times, right? So, yeah, because it's. it's um, I, I, I like the, I, I, the word I'm thinking of is non-adversarial. Mm -hmm. That even if we disagree on something, we are not adversaries. We are not enemies. Um, and then I adversarial. I'm just going to leave it there. Spell check was a wonderful invention for me. I'm not the worst, worst at spelling, but I'm definitely not the best. <laughs> yeah. Those are, um, again, a great, a great group of, of, of things that, you know, when we create these environments that we've talked about, it has this effect. If, if these are the things that we want to feel or that we feel when people really welcome us, uh, Feeling, feeling valued, feeling cared for, uh, feeling welcomed, wanted. Like we're not an enemy of somebody, but we are on the same team, even if we're not on the same team, um, that we're expected included. The, these things are the opportunity that we have to instill when we are our way to welcome 
other people. When we do those little things, when we kind of go through those nuts and bolts, but then when we live into the values of hospitality. And that's kind of where I want to go from here. I want to, we've talked about creating a welcoming environment, and a lot of this is very much thinking through those nuts and bolts of, of what kind of atmosphere does that look like? What does it feel like? But there is really a deeply Christian understanding in hospitality, and it goes even further than the things that we've talked about here this morning. Um, so with that, I have a few different scripture passages that um, I want to want to share. We'll actually look through two different sets of them. Uh, but the first are a set of commands that were given to the church, and we find these in each of the new te- these New Testament letters. Uh, first, Romans twelve thirteen. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, said, Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. In Hebrews 13.2, we read the author of Hebrews writing to, to those of a Jewish background. Those Jewish background believers said, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some of you have entertained angels without knowing it. Uh, kind of a famous passage. And then 1 Peter 4.9 be hospitable to one another without complaining. It's got a nice little tag there on the end. <laughs> without complaining. Uh, what do you notice in these three passages? Hospitality, hospitality. Hospitality, 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 yeah. Yeah, you've, you've aptly pointed out that in these first two, it's specifically to strangers. Not just hospitable to your friends, not just hospitable to, you know, people that you like, but hospitable to, to strangers, to those you don't even know. An interesting thing, I think, when I think of the different commands in the New Testament, I don't know about you, but these are not the first ones that, that come to mind. But they're there. It's a repeated theme. There are other passages we could go to that go the same thing. It's also interesting to see them in a row. Mm-hmm. You know, we've all read them separately. Yeah. But to, uh, it's a pretty big impact. Um, there's another set of, well, actually, I, I don't want to cut you guys off. Is there anything else to jump set? Mm-hmm. If it says without complaining, there must be something to complain about, right? Yeah. I like that. something as simple as not to Yeah. Come back tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. There's an approach to that that's, that's uh, it, yeah. I think that third one especially it breathes into how we approach that situation because it's, being hospitable without complaining of, don't put it off. And that's, you, you've added to that, that joy, that part of it, God wanting us to have joy with it. If we were to go back and look at these in context, which I'd highly encourage you to do, context helps us understand really what's being talked about. These stand on their own okay, but they're so much deeper. When you look to what's around them, that is another piece that goes with it, of being joyful. Those are, that's in the, the essence of the, or in the intent of the, the message as well, that is in the surrounding, ver- the verses that surround each of these. Um, talks more about how you should be as, as a church. How do we live into this as Christians? If we were to keep looking on, and we were specifically to focus on what attributes do we look for in those who are leaders in the church? 
right? Those who are, are leading and facilitating doing uh, different leadership roles throughout the church, again, New Testament letters uh, by Paul have a common theme. These are a little closer together. I hope you can read them, though. But 1 Timothy 3, 2, when Paul is writing to Timothy, encouraging him in his leadership and how to conduct himself, how to lead, he said, Now a bishop must be above reproach, uh, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, and an apt teacher. And then again, writing on a bishop when he's writing to Titus, for a uh, bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or addicted to wine or violent or greedy for gain, but he must be hospitable, a lover of goodness, prudent, upright, devout, and self-controlled. And then in 1 Timothy 5, uh, 9 through 10, he's actually talking about uh, widows who would be serving in the church. Uh, that's, that's that context of these women who are in some ways supported by the church because their, their husbands had passed away, which in the ancient world, the whole social security system, you know, there was no formal social security. Family was your social security. That was your safety net. If you didn't have that, you were in deep trouble. So widows would be supported by the church. They'd be picked up and caught, but they would also serve in the church. They would do these different leadership positions. And so he said to them, let a widow be put on the list to be provided for by the church if she is not less than 60 years old and has been married only once. She must be well attested for in her good works as one who has brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to doing good in every way. So what do you see in these passages? What jumps out to you about these? What? They are demanding, demanding requirements. So the, the requirements of leadership are very demanding and include hospitality as part of yeah. the assumption of the, being a leader. Yep, one of those common threads of each of those is that a leader is expected to be hospitable, uh, to be welcoming. Mm -hmm. for that. So it shows importance. It does. To, of choosing that of one of the, the attributes definitely elevates it in its importance. Uh, there are other things that, that could have been said of a leader has to be X, Y, or Z, but you know, these are some of the ones. And there's not too much else apart from these. I, I've included a little more of these so you can, can see what it's included with. Uh, so we're, we're talking about hospitality in the context of invite people over for a couple of hours for a small group. I'm curious in mm -hmm. that context whether hospitality was that plus like travelers coming through, open your house up and let people stay for yeah. as long as they need to and feeding them and such. So I'm, I'm wondering if We've got just mm -hmm. a small piece of what the whole word means, but again, I that's it, yeah, on. precisely. That is uh, exactly where we're going. <laughs> Don, you you have preceded where we were going because there's um, well, I'm not a shill. He didn't pay me. I didn't know. <laughs> you can tell it's not perfect because there's a question here in between it. So, <laughs> uh, but I was gonna say the, and and we'll come to a slide that has it earlier, but. The word hospitality, the Greek word that's translated in each of these passages that we've just read, uh, that comes up again and again, is philonexia, which literally means to love the stranger. The hospitality at its core, you know, we, we can think about welcoming, and that's the context in which we use it, but it literally means to welcome the stranger. That That is an attribute. And so, yes, we are... We are talking about here in small groups, how do we embody this uh, Christian ethic, this Christian value that is deeply rooted in what it means to be a Christian, especially a Christian leader. Um, how do we live into that? I don't want to 
cut off that question. We can come back to that, but there's a, a British pastor, his name is Pete Gregg, and he uh, started the 24-hour prayer network. They've been involved in revivals that have actually happened across Europe. Uh, and has, has led there, has been involved with Holy Trinity Brompton, which is a, one of the, the anomaly Anglican churches in England that is actually exploding. Uh, most of them are going down and down and down year after year. They're exploding and growing. He's involved with that, that church. Um, and on Facebook, he said, people tell me that they have the gift of hospitality, by which I think they mean that they like dinner parties. They have or aspire to have a beautiful home with an underused spare room in which they enjoy entertaining exotic, interesting, appreciative guests who confirm just how lovely their home is. This is not the gift of hospitality. This is the gift of a box of chocolates. Biblical hospitality starts in the heart and not the IKEA catalog. It is a really bad lifestyle choice. He said true hospitality allows for interruption goes the second mile, and above all is present to people. And he said, this is where I fail the most. Listening is the highest form of hospitality, says Henry Nowen, not to change people, but offering them space where change can take place. Hospitality like this rarely comes with a box of chocolates. It can often hurt our schedules, our emotions, our bank accounts, and yes, it can even mess up our homes. So it's going well beyond that having a nice space and having these, these attributes that we think about. It's going beyond that into a character ethic. He's not saying don't do those things, right? He's saying we have to live into the deeper meaning of what it means to have Christian hospitality because, uh, as we said, it, it is literally to love the stranger, that's, that's what it means in Greek. So my question for you is, who is a stranger? Somebody I haven't met yet. Stranger is somebody you haven't met yet. Or it could be the next door neighbor that you don't really know. It could be the next door neighbor that you don't really know. Could be the person you know. I know. A str you, yeah, the person you know could be the stranger. A but dangerous a habit. Stranger from the original language, where mm -hmm. people are free, is not the person next door. It says the word generally notes a person from a foreign land residing in Palestine. Such persons enjoy them, but many privileges and common with the Jews, but are still separate from them. And mm -hmm. it talks about that this is a person who's not a foreigner, a person that still maintains a home in another country. This is more like what we call. So from another country or another culture mm -hmm. uh, that we are encountering. So it is not a stranger in the technical sense of the word may be defined to be a person of foreign, non-Israelish extraction resident within the limits of the promised land. He was distinct from the proper foreigner, inasmuch as the latter still born to another country and willing to visit Palestine as a traveler. He was still more distinct from the nations and not Israelite peoples. The term may be compared with our expression Mm -hmm. So there's two senses of that word stranger. There's a general sense where it is just somebody you do not know. And Donna, as you said, you, you know, it could be somebody that you know, but I think what you're getting at is you might not really know Somebody you might know of, you don't really know them. Um, so there's that sense, right, of them just being foreign to you. And then there is the more specific sense of what was used going back into the Jewish law of a stranger was someone who is a foreigner, but who is sojourning in the land. Today we would call that person a refugee. Uh, somebody who was coming there, traveling, sojourning in the land, and um, the uh, law in Deuteronomy 10, no, nope, I'm going the wrong way, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19, in the law that God gave to the ancient Israelites, 
uh, he, he told them, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So what, let me ask, what do you notice in this passage about how, how strangers, and that idea of hospitality, how, how that is spoken of here? What jumps out to you? You were you were a stranger, and what would it feel like if you were in a foreign land? What would you want somebody to do mm -hmm. like that? And also that idea of God loves strangers. You are be like God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Empathy is part of it. Of this is what you were. And a lot of it, if you read the Old Testament law, when God is talking to the Israelites, he's telling them, remember, remember, remember. It's one of the most uh, repeated commands that you'll find in the Bible, remember. He's telling them, remember that you were strangers so that you will treat strangers the same way you want to be treated. But then, uh, Don, as you've, you've pointed out aptly, there's that connection between how we treat others being connected with how God treats them. Because God loves the stranger, you shall also love the stranger. I'm struck by, this is very different than hospitality. This is you will love the stranger. That's a very different thing. You know, I can give them food and clothing, but loving the stranger What do you guys think about that? And, and then I'm thinking, I, I do real estate, so I'm thinking, if you think about all the old houses, how they used to be really close to the road, so people yeah. can find you because they no longer the highway, I'm thinking a lot of that is part of what we're hearing in this. These were people as they're traveling, and you suddenly are there walking by, the sun's going down, and you knock on the door, that was the closest when you needed to stop. Show up at my door at dinner time asking for an extra place to stay. Love would be the first thing I would think about. Yeah. Could it inconvenience? It could be very inconveniencing and frustrating. Maybe even scary. You're like, I don't, I don't know this person. You know, that makes me think of today's world. I don't think we want that stranger coming to our door. I mean, that's our first thought. Yeah. But I've heard stories from my grandparents who are no longer living. Um, when there were hobos or, mm -hmm. you know, walking around, they came to the doors yep. all the time. But the houses were easily accessible. People expected it. They gave them food. Um, maybe they gave them a place to sleep. It was a whole different feel than today. Mm -hmm. It makes, I mean, I'm not getting political here, but reading that and after what you just said, it makes me think about <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. We I I didn't mean for this to come out at the same time as all this, but it is uh, it is amazing how that that can be very apt in that situation. We'll, what we will always debate as a nation what our obligations are to other people who are not residents or citizens of our country, but as Christians. As Christians, this is how we are to treat people. You shall love them. I think we all have to pray about what that means for us, but the command is, you shall love them. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. strangers that we have to treat the same. Mm -hmm. It's 
the entire backstory to the parable of the Good Samaritan. So in, in ancient Israel, in the ancient Near East in general, hospitality culture dictated that when somebody came to your door that you would provide for them. You would provide them, uh, you know, water or something to, to rehydrate. You'd provide them some food. Uh, if a guest was coming to your house, you provide them a bowl of water so they could wash their feet. Uh, when we read of, there's a tale at the end of Judges, and also it kind of mirrors Sodom and Gomorrah story, where the angels have come and you know they're out in the square. They were brought into the house by Lot. He offers them a place to stay. That's in many ways a tale of hospitality and how everybody else was failing to show hospitality. There's a lot of other, specifically in, in both of those, there's a lot of other sins going on there, but it is a, a part of hospitality, of you would welcome someone in, you'd give them a place to stay because that's what you were to do. Now you're always expected to do that of a fellow person who is in your family. right? You'd always put your family member up. You might, you'd always put your clan member up, somebody who's in that extended circle. But as it got further and further, you know, the expectation of whether you would put that person up was much lower. To the point that when you get to somebody who's a foreigner, sojourning in your land, you know, escaping a drought, escaping war, whatever, you know, did people actually expect them to do that? You know, and then it becomes a little more shady. Well, God makes it a lot more clear for the Israelites when he says, you know, that was you. There was a famine that sent you to the land of Egypt. Even though you ended up slaves, you were sojourners in that land. And they took care of you. They gave you a place. You need to show that to others. You know what it's like to be a stranger in a foreign land. To not have the rights of those citizens. To not have the things that you need. So you're supposed to help them. It, I, I think I noticed in this one too, and I'm sorry if I jumped anybody off who thought this, but it's paired in with the orphan and the widow. Right? The orphan and the widow are the ones who don't have anybody else to take care of them. The orphan has no parents. The widow has no husband to take care of her, or her father can't take care of her. That was, in that day, a woman's, I don't want to like, say this in a pejorative way, a woman's place, though, of how she was always taken care of was determined by the men in her life. First it was her father, then it was her husband, and eventually it would be her sons. They were the ones who were expected to take care of her. If she didn't have those people, nobody was there for her. So he says, take care of the widows. Now, coming up to that parable of, of the Good Samaritan, right, that Jesus told, if you remember, when Jesus was asked, you know, who is my neighbor? That was the question. Who is my neighbor? In a strict sense, a neighbor was somebody who was a fellow Israelite. If you were not an Israelite, you weren't a neighbor. But Jesus then tells that story of the Good Samaritan, right? We assume the person who's injured on the road was a, uh, an Israelite. It never explicitly says, but it says, a man was attacked by bandits, left for dead on the road. Two Israelites, supposedly his, his fellow countrymen, come along and they don't do anything. The one who comes and helps him is the foreigner, the Samaritan, which was like their Samaria became like this foreign place. It's right in the land, but they became two separate communities. And so they were like the enemy. So it's interesting because Jesus is, through his parable, extending it, extending who your neighbor is all the way to your enemy. He says at the end of it, who is that man's neighbor? Who is that man's neighbor? He's extending who your neighbor is all the way to the enemy. So in God's mind, in Jesus' mind, if all of these people are neighbors going all the way to the person you don't like, you don't trust, you don't want to associate with, then are there really any strangers? You know, you might not know somebody, but there's nobody who's like, well, I'm not going to include them. I'm going to... Uh, put them on a list of people I don't have to respond to. The, the hospitality goes all the way to the furthest person. Um, and this is something that the Israelites struggled to live into. They did different times and places, did a, a good job at. But 
Uh, it was something that the early church that made them infectious, that made them uh, so different, that stood out, and it was actually uh, what got them persecuted. And I have a short video by a, a pastor from Australia whose name is Michael Frost, and he's talking about the different way that Christians live that made them contagious. Um, and you can take a listen. We conquered and subverted the Roman This is a clip Empire from a sermon that he gave. By living such an extraordinarily, exquisitely alternate lifestyle, we literally transformed history. Do you know that in the fourth century, the emperor of Rome, a guy called Julian the Apostate, became so concerned that the Christian movement was subverting and taking over the empire that he sent a directive out to all his officials, Roman governors right throughout the empire, saying, we are in trouble. We are going to lose control of this empire if we do not stop these Christians. From what? Preaching in the, in the marketplace? Door knocking? Evangelicubing? What was his big concern about them? That these Christians actually feed people who are not part of their assemblies or gatherings. These people tend the, cra the graves of the dead who are not part of their religion. These people practice hospitality and take strangers into their homes. These people treat their, their, their wives as their sisters. These people treat slaves as their brothers. He delineates all the evil things that the Christians are doing. And because they're doing them, Romans are falling into their religion in droves. We transformed the empire by living such a freaky, weird life in such a way that no Roman had ever seen it before. Every man had three women, a wife to bear him sons, a concubine for sex, and a mistress to be seen in public with. Slaves were treated unspeakably terribly. We treated women as chattel. We cared not for the poor. We had no interest in hospitality, in hospices, in hospitals. We didn't heal people, we didn't care for people. It was dog eat dog, it was men on top, it was only the strong survived. And then along comes Christians, followers of Jesus, and we healed the sick, and we fed the hungry, and we treated women as equals. And whether you are pagan or Jewish or otherwise, you are welcome into our table, you ate our food, you drank our wine. We tended you while you were sick, we cared for your grave if you died. And Julian the Apostate writes to all the Roman governors and says, we're going to lose control of the empire if these people keep doing this. And his was his directive. Don't stop them, because if you stop them, there would be outrage, wouldn't there? He says to all the Roman governors, I want you to outlove the Galileans. Build better hospitals. Feed more hungry people. Take care of the lost and the lonely and the slave. Well, guess what? That didn't work. Why didn't that work? Because you can't make a pagan governor love someone. It's not a Christian strategy, is it, folks? We are filled with the Holy Spirit of love. And my friends, in the first century, second, third, fourth centuries, when Christians lived like that, it was so intriguing, so outrageous, so unlikely, so unheard of, so bizarre, so countercultural, that of course people availed themselves of that hospitality, and of course they then said, Why do you do this? And of course they declared the Lordship of Jesus. Are you with me? My friends, being a fine, upstanding, middle-class, suburban American is not intriguing. Paying your taxes, putting your kids in private schools, keeping a nice, clean house, waving politely to the neighbours, it's not questionable. My friends, we need to learn to discover what it looks like 
to live so counterculturally people will want to know who the heck are you? So he's talking about what made the early Christians different. And I don't think hospitality is the whole of that, but he's talking about all those pieces that go into it. And as you guys so aptly were pointing on, you know, when we talk at the beginning, when we're talking about different things that make a welcoming small group, we're talking about one piece, but that's like the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about a deeper ethic that goes so much further. And it's something that the church when we've done our best, have really lived into that. Um, I, I think of, in more modern times, Corey Ten Boom, who, it wasn't like she's like, I have to live into being a hospitable Christian. But when the Nazis were coming into the Netherlands and were rounding up the Jews, she was going and welcoming people into her home and hiding them. You can read the book, The Hiding Place, wonderful book. But it was just what she did. It wasn't like she's like, I have to decide to be hospitable. She just lived into that. Um, and I think of Dorothy Day's uh, Catholic social activist said, all Christians are called to be hospitable, but it's more than serving a meal or filling a bed, opening the door. It is to open ourselves, our hearts, to the needs of others. Hospitality is not just shelter but the quality of welcome behind it. And so with all these things in mind, we've, kinda, we've gone deep and we've come back up. Uh, I, I want to ask, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our small groups? Uh, how, do, how do you think this plays into how we, we operate our small groups? You've got to be genuine. Mm -hmm. I like that thing, right? I'm gonna go over here. Some of these I'm sure don't, don't necessarily fit in one word on the board, but. Well, I think most of our small groups have, aside from just meeting and learning and studying together, We've also chosen uh, different uh, mission things to be part of the mm -hmm. church to support those and, and maybe grow some new ones. Can so include a beyond ourselves, I guess. That's probably even better than what I'm writing on here. Thinking beyond ourselves. Feeling very constrained by the edge of the board. I know I gave you a lot to chew on there. <laughs> I figured it'd be easier if we started with, with the easy stuff <laughs> instead of, well, you know, providing adequate seating will seem like nothing compared to. Um, the, I think the funniest part was it's not like the Christians were trying to overthrow the Roman government. It's just when you live the way that Christ has called us, it will inevitably run against our own culture, uh, our own governments, other, other things, you know. And so much today is the way that it is because of just the, transform, the transformation that was brought through Christians, uh, through that weird way that they lived their lives, that it no longer became weird. Mm -hmm. Say uh, we're a six-week group and you can't come. It's 
somebody wants to come, can they come? Mm -hmm. We started with our invitation list of the people I already know, and this is, it should be a lot of people I don't know. This should be strangers outside. I should be doing hospitable things with my neighbors because I should be doing hospitable things with my neighbors. Keeping the doors of our small group open, and then you, I mean, you're kind of talking about life, just in how, how do we live into that, that ethic of, of living with the doors of our lives open to, to welcome others. Yeah, that's the the dilemma of uh, of how it goes. And we'll, next week we'll talk more of of different ways that we can continue to really. I mean, if you're practicing this, then it's going to become a problem. <laughs> of, of suddenly we have more people than we have space, or suddenly we have more people than we can can function with in conversation. And we'll talk about different ways that you can still do that, but think really, you gotta start thinking about multiplication. I mean, that's what happens, what has to happen. Uh, you, you can't just continue to grow things exponentially forever. Uh, there, you will hit a plateau of conversation. I mean, you just, sociologically, you just can't have a relationship with really know what's going on in each other's lives once you get above a certain number. Um, it's in incredibly hard. Other ideas, thoughts? I'm not sure this fits, but our group has become a support group for other things in people's lives, like death. And mm -hmm. Support group. Mm -hmm. So you've gone, yeah, you go beyond just doing the Bible study, and it's, it's encompassing... You're, I guess in some ways we could say you're ministering to the whole person, to the different support that they need for loss or connection, different things like that. Yeah? Which is great. I mean, to me, that's, that's all the point was while I was supposed to Yeah. It's not just about coming, not just coming together to read the Bible. Right. It's one piece, but yeah, how do we walk with Jesus together? I know, uh, oh, so sorry. No, okay. As just to say, I think personally, I believe that there are a lot of conundrums here because our governmental challenge seems to be top, top is immigration. But by the same token, the church's top, top might be the fact that there are 70 million people on the planet who don't have a home. Mm hmm so we even use the concept small group. So to me, it's like tears, you know, T-I-E-R-S. Mm -hmm. You have immigration. You have 70 million people on the planet without a home. And then you're talking about small groups. This doesn't, to me, sign, kind of seem to fit. Yeah. Um... Because Christ's message in the Great Commission was, as we all know, Make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them. So yep. the church's mission is one. Great tradition. Yeah. And we have a market, a market, an audience of seven million plus our community, plus the moral community. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm very much a mission mission focused person. I mean, that's what that's what drives me. That's what uh, I put my focus on. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is is how do I live that out? What does that mean particularly? Like that's that's the big picture. What does that mean particularly in my life? How am I living that out? Um, and so it seems like it's a small thing, but I think it's a really a big thing. But some of the small, some of the, the biggest things we can accomplish are in the small things. In some ways, it seems like, and this is just talking about the topic broadly, not specifically small groups, but if I'm welcoming somebody in my home who is, is a stranger to me, that seems really simple, right? Like inviting a neighbor over for dinner who I don't know, that's a really simple thing, but that's also an incredibly profound thing because, one, it's not what we tend to do. We tend to leave neighbors who we don't know as neighbors that we don't know. We stay in our own circle. We stay in our own lane. But two, it, it goes against the culture that we have. But I think that's what, what God calls us to. Is it's not just generic. There are specific people that go with all of that. Um, our ability to personally impact someone on the opposite side of the world may be limited but we do have the ability to impact the people who are right next door. We have the ability to impact the people who are a part of this church who are not connected. And so that's, you know, that's what I want you to think about. It's in those things that the amazing thing is, for such a long time, different Christians have talked about how, how do we live out that Great Commission? If God wants to reach all the people of the world, how are we going to do that? Make disciples of all nations. The thing is, it's like if all of us simply invested in three people, if there were three people that we could help be disciples of Jesus Christ and walk with them, and we taught them to go and do the same, then they would go and do three people. And then if they did it well, and then they went and did three people, what you start to have is an exponential curve. And it'll spread, not just from here in Zionsville, it'll spread throughout this area, it'll spread throughout this state, and because of just the way things are connected in the global, the local world, we live in a global and local world now, it'll go from here to the other side of the world because it's, it's like uh, six degrees of separation if you think about it. Right? They talk about how there's six degrees of separation between any two people on earth. Well, if you make a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple, you just reach somebody on the opposite side of the earth. So the question I bring it to, and this is a long explanation for, I think, a, a profound but simple question, is that small groups are a part of that discipleship process. It is a way that we stay together and walk with Jesus together, that we can help make disciples. I think we always need to be investing in people who are not a part of that. As we include them, and then they include others, and they include others, it reaches further and further and further. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there's a million good, good and great, good things that we could be doing, but the question is, what are the great things that God is calling us to do specifically? So, maybe that seems like a cheap answer, but that's the best I've got. Mm -hmm. So, you know, also taking into consideration that maybe while we're trying to form our groups to be looking for people that we don't know who maybe are new to the church or you've seen in a class before or you haven't interacted with as much and, you know, being brave and just asking, making the invitation like we talked about last week. Mm -hmm. But I think so much of what it can be intimidating about church is it can feel very clicky. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, I like the... I think she makes a good point there. We have to fight that part of it that says, okay, I would be asking this person, but I'm not going to ask this person over here. He's not fit, it's like a And taking uh, beyond our small group, you know, and following the rules of God and being possible. 
hospitality and all that. Uh, how many of us have been stopped down here at 421 with people holding out their little signs and so on? Would you invite them to come to your house to spend the night and have supper with you and so on? As opposed to uh, a person we happen to see at church and looks like they're going through a rough time, but you might ask them. Mm -hmm. Describing the difference between congeniality, meaning getting with people who are like you, right. and conviviality, which is just like learning to like everybody. It's a subtle sounding difference, but mm -hmm. it's a big difference. And I go back to the When you say our yeah. group, that right. sounds very close. Yeah, it does. You're right. <laughs> I mean, you're right. But I go back to your Deuteronomy passage, though. Then you realize, I don't think people during the times of Deuteronomy were probably that different in Northern than they are today. And they opened their home to complete strangers. They couldn't even Google and check them out on Facebook before they were yeah. born. I mean, so these are complete strangers. And how much that shows a different level of faith, a different level of feeling I should share my life, my life story, my faith with people just suddenly bumped into me and they chose me. Yeah. So how do we need to think through small groups that we we are open enough that people will want to knock on our door or that we are able to share more about how God has been in our life. Mm -hmm. And it does show a different piece of character. This is not exactly a small group, but I just look at how our church and the churches that welcome the promised families. Yeah. They are so, and they have, they have told me before, we always feel so welcome mm -hmm. here. Not just the surroundings, but you guys really welcome us. Mm hmm And it's, it, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, there's a, a guy who comes and he speaks quite often at Asbury Seminary, where I went to seminary down in, Wilmore, Kentucky. He actually is in um, Eastern Ohio, right where Ohio University. I can't remember the name of the town right now, but uh, he's been running just different ministries uh, for the better part of 30 years now that specifically try to make place for people who are homeless or uh, just a lot of other things of, of practicing Christian hospitality. And he said it's it's this balance of finding adequate levels of, okay, I'm protecting my family and keeping them safe in ways that I need to keep them safe, but also still expressing that openness in ways that how can I help them? Because uh, he said at first, we would, he's like, we would just let people come and live with us. And then we figured out, you know, that wasn't always the best. And that didn't always help them. That it could be, you could actually hurt them because you're enabling them. He said he had to learn these different boundaries. So there is, is different stuff that goes with this. But I think small groups are probably one of the, as we're, we're narrowing it back in, they're probably one of the most uh, low risk type things that we can do, right? You know, we're committing to uh, fairly low risk in terms of time. Uh, low risk in terms of a lot of other things relationally, financially, uh, but it is something that I believe can make a, a pretty big impact on, on people who are not a part uh, of your group who you don't know. That's a good, don't let the perfect fill the enemy of the good. <laughs> the good. Yeah. Don't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. Yeah. Don't allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. Yep. They would say the good is the enemy of great, but perfect is the enemy of, of even pursuing either of those. So we'll, well, I can never do that to the highest end. I'm never going to welcome random people that I don't know off the street into my home, so I might as well not do it. 
Yeah. So again, it's how, how can we live this out just in this area? I've given you a lot to chew on, to think about life in general. But I want you to be thinking about, praying about, what does that mean for my small group, for how we conduct ourselves, how we do that? We could talk last week about thinking invitation, and if we're going to have an invitational atmosphere, leaving a chair open, always making sure that we, we have, okay, there's a space for somebody else here, the person who is not here yet, who has not yet been invited to continue to go and, and welcome people. Um, invitation and hospitality go together hand in hand, and uh, I think we'll see it in next weeks that making room for those people in our groups and continuing subsequent groups, that, that, that goes hand in hand with it as well. Uh, but I want to be uh, respectful of your time. I know we're a few minutes over here. Uh, so I'll close us in prayer. And if there's anything else you, know, you guys want to chat about, feel free. Uh, we, can, we can chat a little more. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this time that we could get together uh, for a, a heavier subject of thinking about what it means to truly live into the hospitality you have called us to. Uh, Lord, we, we know that you love all people, uh, even the people that we know that we do not like, uh, the people who are the other for us, but Lord, you've called us to love them. And so, Lord, uh, we ask that you would give us the same love that you have, that we could uh, treat others the way that you treat them. Uh, Lord, we pray that the strangeness of the ways that we do, the weird way that we conduct ourselves would uh, reach others, uh, that it would inc include those who are far from you, uh, whether that's a person who's been going here for five years and just has never really got connected, or whether that's somebody who is right down the street from us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you just continue to work in our hearts uh, to uh, show us who to invite, who to include, uh, and to really help us to live these things out. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.